<sighs> okay. Let's dive into it. I um, I ended up going a little bit longer through that stuff there. We took a bit longer this morning to get through some of that discussion. So um, we're going to kind of carry on into this integrated pest and disease man management discussion. And there's kind of really three themes or three areas that I want to cover on this. And this um, we're just going to roll straight into part one and two. But I, I want to kind of start the discussion with a little bit about plant species diversity and how we can design the um, the cropping kind of systems with a little more plant species diversity and how that can help as a starting tool for um, pest and disease, lowering a bit of that pest and disease pressure. Um, and then we're going to talk about then the use of biology, so biologicals, microbials and type things, and how they can help also help to manage plant health and pest and disease. Um, and then we'll move into the, the second half, which overlaps a bit with this morning's discussion on nutrition and some of the key nutrients then more so on the pest and disease kind of side of things again. So that's kind of where we'll take this session. Um, and we'll just, we're kind of winging the gender. We'll take a little coffee break when everybody looks like they need one. Um, and uh, do a quick comfort break and things and then come back and, and finish the last session. So, okay. So we're going to talk really um, pest disease. Um, I'm not really going to cover too much on weeds. I apologize for this one. I do have some weed material, but um, just for this discussion today, we're going to focus a bit more on the um, uh, insects and disease and um, um, for, for this. And, and really, as the title, as you all know, as the title suggests, it's really about integrating strategies. It's about that there's, you know, there's no silver bullet to, to manage a disease or a pest. It's about bringing multiple strategies together. Um, in an integrated approach. That's really the, the essence of what we're talking about there. And that helps us to alleviate, um, to kind of hedge our bets and um, spread those strategies so that we're not too overly reliant just on one of those inputs. And so that's kind of the idea there is that when we bring different strategies, use different things, different modes of attack, um, that ultimately helps to kind of help block. We have many stages, um, an integrated approach, many tools in the toolbox many stages in which we can at least block or suppress or slow down some of that pest or disease pressure. And that's the essence of kind of, um, you know, what an integrated strategy is about. If we're, if we're all very uniform, we're doing the same thing again and again on many layers, we, we're obviously opening up that opportunity for the foot in the door for the pest or disease to, to come in. So um, I'm going to break this into these three themes. Diversity is kind of the first one. How we kind of manage the production system from an ecological point of view. What some of the eco ecological principles that are at play here that can help us. And the key point here is just a bit more plant species diversity. And I'll share some really good examples on this. Um, and then on top of that, we can layer on these other tools, the biology. And that might mean just generally trying to encourage good healthy soil biology, good functional biology. It may mean using some biological inputs or a combination of both of these. Um, so we'll kind of explore how microbes and how they can also help in this picture, a good biological functioning. And then, as I mentioned, we'll touch on nutrition, specific focus now on the key nutrients that play a very direct role in um, helping the plant immunity or helping to fight off disease. So um, this diversity point of view, it's, it's really just to say that when we plant a um, monoculture of the same plant, and the same variety of that plant, we have complete uniformity. And yeah, of course, I know that there are many benefits to that, some of the practical benefits that make it easier for you to manage that, um, some of the timings, the harvest and fertilizer management, there's many, many benefits to the monoculture, practical benefits, of course there are. Um, but we have to also just acknowledge that that also comes with an Achilles heel, with a weak point, and that is that sheer uniformity at scale. And that simply means that if those plants, if one of those plants is, because they're all the same, if the plant is susceptible to a disease or to an insect pest, then they all are susceptible. And when they all are susceptible, this is how we see these rapid spread. It's the rapid spread. When that pest or disease moves in, they're all vulnerable. The pest can rapidly move through that field. So that is one of the 
drawbacks and one of the weaknesses of that monoculture is that she um, that vast kind of uniformity and it's just about a kind of acknowledging that and therefore if we can other strategies to just try and break that up and I'm kind of going to go deeper into this but starting back at a kind of um, higher level sure there's many ways in which we could think about diversity plant species diversity how can we bring a bit more diversity into the production system and sure that could be diversity through time so crop rotations, better rotations, maybe bringing in some more novel cash crops, just to try and extend or widen that rotation. That's diversity through time. Um, it's still monoculture in each window there, but through time we're kind of breaking that up and, and changing that through the rotation. So that's a good, great foundation, as I'm sure many of you are also doing. Um, but then from there, you could kind of go into layers and layers of diversity underneath that. And it could be things like, um, if we are an annual dominant system, is there space for us to use some perennial plants? Maybe a perennial phase in the rotation. This is becoming um, quite common in some other parts of the world, you know, especially where we talk about livestock integration. If we have the luxury of having livestock available, then having a perennial phase to produce fodders and pastures and things for them can be a great way to kind of break up that annual rotation. So we might do a few annuals, have a three or four year, five year perennial phase, maybe go back into some annuals and keep kind of rotating that way. So bringing the opposite of the norm, so bringing perennial into the annual system. Maybe for those of you who are more perennial, the grazing people here, if you already are perennial, um, there are some benefits to bringing some annual plants into the system because they're all different and they do different, different plants do different things, different specialities. So we're just kind of trying to bring a bit of different modes of action different benefits to some of those opposite kind of plants. Same deal with winter summer. If we're a summer dominant system, can we bring some winter cool season plants in? Or if we're a cool season system, can we bring some summer plants in um, just to try and <clears throat> break up again that monotony? And then we have, of course, things like the cover crops. So that's kind of really focusing out of the productive season and the post season. What can we do with covers? And can we bring, of course, it's very easy there to bring a lot more diversity into those covers with some cocktail covers. Um, to kind of add a, a burst of diversity, um, a burst of kind of those interactions for the soil life, for that soil health at that time. Um, but we can also, I know, uh, of course, a post-season cover crop, or if you're, again, livestock integrated and you can graze those, that's really easy. But when we talk about the cropping phase, of course, it's much harder to do these really intense polycrops, um, to do really diverse systems. Uh, unless you're just kind of grazing them off. So that's where things like then the companion cropping or the intercropping, just, just even going from one to two, um, there is some big changes and big benefits to the system just from having two different root systems as compared to one. And we're going to come back and share some examples of that um, in, the, in the final presentation. So I'm very encouraged to see this kind of traction these recent years in, in the intercropping thing and the companion cropping. I think there's um, a lot of, it's a really good example of just trying to bring a little bit more diversity um, into the actual productive phase, not just kind of post-harvest phase. Okay, yep, good question. Difference between companion and intercrop. So for, for my definitions here, um, an intercrop is when you're planting two or so, two or more, but usually two crops together that you're going to take both, take both through to harvest. So that would be an intercrop, whereas a companion crop is often then talked about it's really the second plant there is more of a companion it's an auxiliary plant that may not be harvested so with a companion it might be there temporarily it might be a temporary intercrop but you're going to terminate it um, or it might be an understory a clover understory or something like that that you're not actually going to harvest so that's what i would call a companion it's there you've got the two or three or whatever but ultimately you're still only harvesting one um, but there are many benefits to having those companions so for example there's lots happening, really good work happening on in Canada on the prairies there with intercropping, um, you know, double cropping those together, harvesting those together. Um, lots happening in UK and Europe as well, I would say. In Australia, where it's a lot drier, there's a bit more concern about having sufficient moisture um, for taking the two through to harvest. They really seem to be going a bit more down this companion strategy, whereby they will establish um, some multi-species. It's usually, again, two or sometimes three. They'll have a bit of a, with, let's say with wheat, they might have a, a, a daikon radish, tillage radish, and a faba bean kind of companions and with the wheat. And then they'll grow those three together during establishment, um, through the winter, but really at the back end of the season when we start to switch to um, grain fill, flowering and reproductive mode, etc. 
Um, that's also when the they're moving more and more into the summertime, the soils are drying out, so there's more concerns there about not having enough moisture to finish the main cash crop. So they'll terminate, selective herbicide, they'll terminate those companions and just take the one through to harvest. So that's the, the companion. Um, and then you've got all these other things, maybe non-productive things, like some of these biodiversity strips. You guys have got the prairie strips here, um, I see over on the in the Midwest there that um, look interesting, um, which are, I think are also a really good idea, just close to waterways, these kind of buffer zones and buffer strips to kind of catch any um, water or rainfall or if there is um, some snow melt, etc. Just trying to capture some of that soil or nutrients that could potentially be um, moving towards those waterways. So I think those are really good. I think there's a lot of opportunities to make a bit better use of our field margins, even just with some kind of perennials, some basic kind of grass cover, um, some tall grasses, like some of your native prairie grasses, perfect. Having a bit of kind of tall grasses around the field margins, this provides habitat. This is habitat for beneficial insects that can then migrate into the productive areas, into the cropping zones. So I think like, and you guys are not so much into that kind of here in North America, I see, but like over in Europe, there's some really fantastic stuff happening with field margins and building kind of habitat there. And again, sometimes with flowers and all of that kind of pollinator type stuff as well, but sometimes even just with, with grasses and, and just cover, just green cover, getting some tall grasses. The taller creates more real estate for insects to pack in like a high rise apartment. So you've got more space for them to kind of live and build up some of those beneficial so you know some of these things are also just really good um, as a piece as a part of the overall farm landscape um, you know kind of a patchwork of these kind of spaces that really across the scale of the whole farm or then the landscape scale in your valley or whatnot um, these things can start to add up and provide a bit more habitat for for the ecology for the environment for the beneficial insects and yes they can pay dividends they migrate into the cropping or the productive zones where they can provide pest regulating services um, being predators and things of some of our insect pests. Um, and then trees, you know, agroforestry or silver pastures, trees, pastures and animals, these types of things might not be total relevance in this kind of particular area where your natural habitat is prairie, prairie grass. Um, it might not be so relevant um, to have trees. It's not what naturally would grow here. So, but in other parts of the world or of the country or in other parts of the world, you know, trees may also play um, an important role in that traditional function of the landscape. So like, there's kind of just some broad strategies uh, about in which we could bring more diversity into the system. But I want to drill down a little bit more specifically into how we could think about diversity in the productive zones and how you might kind of manage this. So there's three kind of dimensions to diversity and which ways in which we could think about this. I've touched on the first one already, diversity through time or temporal diversity, that just means crop rotation, diversity through time, where we still might have that monoculture there, but we're breaking that up over those successive years. So that's diversity through time. Then we have spatial diversity. And this is then that example of, say, the intercropping. Uh, and that could be alternate row intercropping, or that could be strip intercropping, uh, like some of the relay type things that's going on also a bit over in the Midwest. You know, it might be however many meters wide of one, then the other, then the other. So strips, many, many rows of each one alternating, or it could just be one row, alternate row um, intercropping. And of course, what you're doing though is a spatial diversity. You're spatially breaking up that monoculture so that every second row or whatever, every six meter wide row, whatever it is, um, is something different and you're breaking that up. And then we have the gen uh, genetic diversity. And this is really then referring to um, variety blends or cultivar blends. So diversity at the genetic level. So instead of, it might still be a monoculture of wheat or whatever, but you could have um, various varieties that you blend together, mixed varieties, which can also then bring a lot of benefits in terms of at a genetic level, breaking up the uniformity of the same variety um, monoculture of the same variety. So these are kind of these three um, ways to conceptualize a bit of diversity, and these are very relevant within the productive zones. You know, these are very relevant for cropping areas, especially uh, ways in which we can bring this diversity to to lower the uniformity and therefore to lower the the pressure that the, the, of which a pest or disease can spread. Because once that pest or disease comes into this field, you know, it's all the same. It's going to spread like wildfire. Every person, every every plant is vulnerable. 
so it's going to be easy for that pest to spread through. So I'm going to show you a great graph now. We're going to talk through this one, and it's going to kind of bring all these ideas together. This is a really good study out of the Netherlands on potatoes. And what you're looking at here is we're going to compare um, some of those examples that we just talked about, um, these kind of strip into croppings and then using mixed varieties within those stripped croppings on potatoes. And we're looking at the buildup of disease pressure. And so our first one is our control. This is just the monoculture. And here's our economic threshold. So this is a threshold whereby they would typically bring in an intervention, a, uh, you know, chem um, fungicide intervention kind of thing. Um, that's our, um, our, our threshold. So the first one here is the control. So where we have monoculture, where we have everyone uniform, very easy conditions to spread, of course that disease very quickly spreads and increases very rapidly and very quickly got, uh, we're looking at across time here, across the days since, of, since the infection was first observed. Um, and you can see within less than five days, we see um, that disease has rapidly spread and has reached that threshold. Now then what they did <coughs> is with these potatoes, they took uh, and the, some two different varieties here and did these strips. So we're now alternating strips of two different varieties. And the first treatment here was six meter wide strips. So six meters of one, six meters of the next, six meters of one, six meters of the next. And you can see that with those six meter strips, because we've now broken up, still a bit of a uniformity within the six meters, but then we're breaking that up with the next six meters. Again, uniformity within that six meters, but still we're breaking it up over each six meters. So what that ultimately does is slow the spread. It just makes it a little harder for that pathogen to kind of move through the entire field because now it hits a different variety, a resistant variety, for example. So that just slows the spread. And yeah, sure, we still got there eventually. It took a bit longer, uh, seven eight days or so, but you can see we still got there, but it certainly helped to slow things down. The next treatment they did was three meter wide strips. So now we're shortening that six meters and now it's just every three meters we're alternating those two. So now we're not, each six meters, not, we're not creating such big kind of mono areas. We're making them smaller with every three meters. And you can see again, what that has done is slows the spread again, where it's taken us much longer now. We're over 10 days, maybe 12 days or so, till we hit that threshold. So just by breaking it up, we're slowing things down. We're still not saying that this is going to control that disease, but it is slowing the vigorousness of that spread. So our next pattern, our next treatments, our final treatments here is combining all three of these. Now within those strips, they started doing variety blends, so mixed varieties of the potatoes. So now you're combining all three, well, you're combining these two things. You've got spatial diversity with those three and six meter strips. And then within each of these strips, now we're adding genetic diversity within each layer there. So as you can kind of see and guess, when we do a six meter you know, we go back to the six meter strips, but with variety blends inside. You can see this is this one here. And so again, we're really just slowing the spread, slowing the spread all the way up here to 16, 17 days. So we're kind of taking a long time to get to that threshold. And then on the last treatment, it's now we cut that back again to three meters, three meter strips, three meter, three, three meter, and then variety blends within those three meter strips. And you can see that in that treatment, we didn't even get to the threshold. Okay, uh, even up to 20 whatever days here, we still hadn't quite got there. So there's nothing special or secret about this. It's just breaking up the monotony and the uniformity of the mon monoculture. Uh, with a little bit more diversity, we don't have that sh uh, sheer uniformity of an ease of spreadability of those pests or disease. It really is just as simple as breaking up kind of barriers, physical barriers, genetic barriers, making it harder for those organisms to, to ultimately spread. So we can start off, we just again have to acknowledge, look, I know the monos cultures have a lot of advantages for you, practically speaking, but if there are ways in which we can just maybe tweak that a little bit with some variety blends or a bit of strip breaking up, um, this can help at least lower the disease pressure. And I'm not saying it's going to control your disease, but it is going to be a tool in the toolbox that's going to lower that disease pressure or give you more time. And sometimes time, even time, is valuable. And let's use this example of the last treatment. What if this is, yes, in really wet weather and you've got high disease pressure, but uh, at the moment with that high humidity and rainfall, high disease pressure, 
sometimes actually just giving yourself a bit more time can be a big gain, a big benefit, because what if there's some warm weather coming? What if there's a heat wave coming next week and you're going to have a big blast of nice hot, dry air coming in, which means that the environmental conditions for that disease spread have now changed. We don't have that humidity anymore. The disease isn't going to spread quite so vigorously, vigorously anyway. So even, even though it didn't, might not have, let's use this example, even though it did not totally control, if it just gives you more time until it gets there, it might be enough time for you to get to next week in some warmer weather, in which then the risk of that disease pressure is immediately diminished anyway. So sometimes those windows of time, even themselves, can be very advantageous. Um, so, you know, in the UK, this is like really good happening over here. So many farmers are really embracing these variety blends. Here's an extreme example of seven different varieties. Um, most are not normally going there. It's normally about three or four seems to be the common number. And this really works. In terms of lowering disease pressure, uh, pressure this is a really easy and good um, strategy. And many, many farmers are embracing this, be them anywhere on the spectrum of the more regen scale or even amongst conventional farmers. Um, it really just helps to lower that disease pressure. So things like variety blends, I think, have got um, a good, uh, there's a really good opportunity there to kind of fine tune these. Now, you do have to choose the varieties a little carefully. Um, they can't be all from the same family. So you've just got to kind of break up some of the heritage lines of those varieties and just mix them up a little bit. Um, but there's kind of just some examples. Like I said, normally people are doing about three or four is probably a bit more common. Um, okay, so that's that. That's the essence of the idea of this diversity discussion. I'm just going to share a few more examples of this with you, but I, you get the premise and the principle at play there, um, really already. That's the idea is just to kind of break it up. And you know, when we think about diversity, of course, like I was saying, it's really easy to conceptualize this in a cocktail cover crop, uh, in a in a pasture setting, um, in a you know for 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 a permanent pasture or you know grazing fodder mix, whatever. Um, it's really easy to do this diversity thing, but of course it gets a bit harder when we talk about cropping. And that's where even just jumping from that one to two, even having two plants in the system can also lower the pest and disease pressure. Having two root systems growing down here can actually change a lot of soil biological functioning, a lot of soil nutrient cycling. I'm going to share some of these examples um, later on. So even small jumps from one to two, I think are still very relevant, very useful, very impactful. Or maybe even again, an understory, having an understory of clover um, or a low growing plant in the understory that might not be an issue in terms of your combine. You don't have to separate it, all of those kind of other hassles or barriers that some people, some farmers find to intercropping. Um, even in the understory um, companion, these can still be a lot of great benefits there. But on the right-hand side, of course, you know, picture says a thousand words. You can kind of see the obvious benefits to that diversity. You got a diverse array of plants, species. They uh, clearly have all different types of root structures, different root architectures, different rooting depths. There are different plant species. They have different nutrient requirements. They're accumulating different nutrients, um, bringing certain nutrients up from the soil. Some more at the deeper, some more at shallow. More efficient use of water through that profile. There's a lot of efficiency gains that come with that diversity um, and it extends upwards above ground. Like you've got different species, different flowering times, again, encouraging the ecosystem, the ecology a bit better. I mean, sure, you know, when this is in full flower, sure, like the insects are absolutely loving this. Like this is an absolute boom town when it's in full flower. But what about just before flower? What about just after flower? You know, so that diversity of flowering times brings also some benefits to the above ground ecology and ecosystem at play there as well. So this is kind of really ultimately the idea and what we're trying to enhance, just use the speciality of different plant species. We're going to talk a little bit about rutexidates in our last presentation, but each of those different plant species, of course, also has a different cocktail of rutexidates, which means they are feeding different parts of that soil microbiome in different ways. So we're stimulating soil biology in much more diverse ways, in a much more broader way um, through some of these um, more mixes. So let's have a look at the context then of bringing it back to pests and disease. Here's a really great study looking at um, some disease pressure, disease aspects um, under different diversity. So we're, we're increasing plant species diversity on the bottom here from one to two to four to eight to 16, and then a, a very diverse treatment all the way up at 60. And what we're looking at is as we increase plant species diversity, we're looking here at the pathogen diversity. 
And of course, as you increase the number of plant species or the number of host plants, sure, the, the number of pathogens that can then grow also goes up. So more diversity of plants does mean more diversity of pathogens. More host plants, more pathogens can come and grow because there's more hosts there. So you do increase the diversity of the pathogens that are present when you increase plant species diversity. However, their ability to cause infection, the overall infectivity or the ability of those pathogens, although there's more diversity of them there, their ability to then cause disease actually declines as we increase plant species diversity. And that's just, again, this it's a dilution effect. It's nothing fancy here. It's just a dilution effect. Because now you don't have this monoculture. We have, let's say, 16 species mix. So now the pathogen blows in on the wind, and here's my host plant. I'm going to start causing disease here, and I'm multiplying, and I'm reproducing. When I start looking to spread and reproduce and push my spores out or, or whatever, um, I'm looking around and I'm seeing 15 other hosts that I cannot cause disease in, that I'm not interested in. And I'm looking around to finally find my 16th one, and it's all the way over here. So there's a lot of barrier, and now I'm looking again, but there's all these other hosts that I can't, you know, and ah, here you are, here's my next one over here. So, of course, it's much harder for that pathogen to spread through because there's all of these non-hosts that the pathogen is not interested in. And that's all it is. It's host dilution. We're diluting the host. Yes, the, the diversity of the pathogens increases, but their ability to then multiply and reproduce and spread is diminished through that more diversity. Nothing fancy. It's as simple as that. It's just diluting those hosts, creating barriers, physical barriers. Now, what about diversity for beneficial insects? I think you can all assume this is um, this is a kind of common one. As you increase the plant species diversity, you also encourage in a lot more beneficial insects because different plants release those different volatile compounds that attract in different pests, etc., uh, predators, etc. And so, as we increase plant species diversity, we also encourage more predators. Um, more beneficial insects who can um, help us manage the pests. And this is really what this study is showing. It's a, a big review, a meta-analysis. So meta-analysis is just a study that gets together all of the other studies that have looked at this, and it brings them all together and kind of reanalyzes them and um, tries to find the overall trends and patterns to kind of find out, okay, amongst all these diverse contexts and all these different situations and different crop types and this, that, and the other, across all of that diversity, what's the overall kind of trend um, that we see, um, that's kind of what a meta-analysis is, just reanalyzing other studies um, and bringing them together. So here we're looking at comparing, um, bringing together 351 different other studies. So we're just under 3,000 points that they're kind of observing and, and comparing here. And we find that increasing plant species diversity reduces the herbivore abundance and the damage. When I say herbivore, I mean insect herbivore, so pests. So we reduce the pest damage, but it increased the beneficials, the predators, the parasitoids, and, and it overall increased plant performance. So more diversity brings in more of the beneficials, reduces the pests, and therefore increases plant performance. Um, and that's that's kind of what they find there. So, um, so yes, on disease, diversity helps. Yes, on insects and pests, yes, diversity helps. And like I said, I put this here just again to a nice visual for you. Here we have an alternate row intercrop. This is a pea mustard. And uh, this is the same field, just taken a couple of weeks apart, obviously. Um, but you can see here we have this physical barrier. And that's it. It's nothing magic. We're just breaking up the monotony. Think about some spores blowing in here through the wind. And um, it's a brassica disease. You know, it's blowing in through here. You know, 50% of the time, we are now hitting a non-host. 50% of that spore load is landing on a pea, in which case those spores are not going to germinate. That's not the host. And so we have inactivated, you know, 50 odd percent just through having a different plant in there, diluting the main host, making it lower pressure. And that's really what that kind of visually, it's just a nice visual kind of cue to understand this kind of barrier type effect. Now, if we do get some spores in here and they start reproducing, again, sporulating, well, again, as those spores migrate out here and here, again, we're hitting non-hosts. So again, we're lowering that disease pressure, that load. And again, I'm not saying it completely stops spread because it doesn't, but it lowers it and it slows it. And that can be very, very helpful, especially then when you layer on top of that other strategies like a bit of biology, some biologicals that we're going to talk about now and some other nutritional kind of strategies.
So um, in the let's use this example of intercropping here. I'm just talking about from one to two. So just putting two plants rather than one, and how that can affect the disease insect. And I've got one slide on weeds for you. So this is from a really good review. So again, this is one of those studies that just reviews all the other studies that look at this. And what they did is say, let's look at all the intercropping studies and how that affects disease. So here we're comparing 101 studies, 196 points of observation. Here's the kind of criteria that they were um, including or uh, filtering out some of the studies. So it's only intercrops of annual cropping. So we're just talking annuals here. Only field experiments, no pot or glasshouse. This is not with agroforestry, so no trees. Only plant diseases, so viruses, bacteria, fungi, etc. Uh, symptoms caused by those infectious agents, not by nutrient deficiencies, and only primary studies, so not looking at other reviews. So that's their criteria, and they found all the studies that meet that criteria that looked at intercropping and going from one to two, and the effects of that on disease. And they found that in 79% of those studies, so 79% of those, I'm not saying 79% reduction in disease pressure, I'm saying 79% of those studies observed a suppression in disease, in disease outcome with the intercropping as compared to the control, compared to the monoculture. So 79% of the time there was suppression of disease, 18% it was neutral, and 3.6% 3, 3 of the time it increase the disease pressure. So it is in the minority. Now those increases were primarily through um, nematodes. This was the kind of the one that seemed to be a bit more, the diversity may encourage a bit more nematodes. But in terms of most of our other diseases, those are not, okay, and again, I'm not saying it's perfect, but those are not bad odds. You know, 79%, 18% neutral, those are not bad odds. Okay, so a little bit of benefit there to that diversity. What about pests? Same deal, we're looking at comparing 153 studies here, pretty much the same criteria. And here they find that with insect pests, 68% of those studies suggest that insect pests will decline, the insect pressure will decline with intercrops versus control. Neutral on 24% and only 8% did it maybe actually increase the disease pressure by having more of those, um, more of those hosts there. And, you know, I think the insect one is really interesting because this overlaps to our discussion earlier about trichomes. And I mentioned that some of those trichomes are glandular, meaning they uh, produce these um, volatile organic compounds. They produce essential oils and all sorts of smelly compounds, volatile organic compounds. And I put this up here as a nice visual to what I'm talking about. Um, and so these compounds, these things that drift off into the air, uh, they can do all sorts of things. And we have studied these and there's some fascinating examples out there. Um, but one of the things that they do is attract in beneficial insects, the predators. So if the pest, if the plant is under attack, it can release these and attract in the beneficials. Now, some of those other compounds, uh, these essential or volatiles and things, can also do all sorts of things like hide the plant, make it a bit invisible, or confuse the insect's ability to detect it. So there's all sorts of things there that they do. But also some of those volatile compounds, Remember, they're gaseous as they drift off and they're gaseous things. In an intercropping context, some of those volatile compounds actually can be breathed in by the companion or they can land on the other companion. And we have some fascinating examples in the literature of how uh, combinations of plants, two plants, how there is this sharing of communication, but also sharing through these kind of volatile compounds, how they communicate to each other or interact through these. And so some of those volatile compounds can be very antagonistic. And this is also some of the effect when we see weeds being very competitive against our cash crop. It's not just that through the roots and they're competing for moisture or nutrients, etc. Some of that is actually these volatile compounds that come off and land on the other plant. And those compounds can be either suppressive or enhancing or stimul stimulating for those plants. Um, and so there's some fascinating examples of this where those compounds land on the leaf. They can trigger an induced response or trigger plant immunity, really strengthen the immunity. And some of those compounds can even be breathed in by the companion through the stomata, where systemically they can also have systemic kind of fungicidal or pest insecticidal type properties or trigger these immune responses. So some of this kind of interaction between those kind of intercrops is also um, an emerging kind of area where there may be a whole host of kind of these volatile interactions 
that are contributing to why it's not just, okay, I mentioned the physical barrier, it's a big part of it, but there may be many layers to this underneath that of how maybe those more diverse stands are a little um, less, uh, a little more resistant to those pests and disease. And this is one on weeds, this is my only slide on weeds, I apologize. Um, here we're looking at 120 studies, same kind of criteria, and they found that in 86% of those studies, um, there was intercropping led to a decrease in weed pressure, 12% neutral, 2% increase. Okay, and again, I'm like I said, I'm not saying this is perfect. I'm not saying this is controlling all of these things, but there is. I think the odds are very good. The odds are on your side. Generally, a bit more diversity is going to lead. And I'm talking intercropping there. That was just one to two, just one to two. Generally, it's going to lean towards less pest and disease pressure. Okay, so however you can kind of think about, conceptualize some of that diversity, particularly if it's in field, um, maybe some of these other non-productive kind of margins or field strips, these types of things, prairie strips, some of those things I think are all kind of excellent. I would encourage you to have a look into some of those and explore those. Okay, so for me that is the foundation. We layer down wherever possible, more diversity through plant species or through varieties, through those cultivars, that genetic diversity. Start with this. This is going to make it easier when we talk about then trying to do these compost extracts or this microbial, this, that, or the other, and get that to kind of contribute. Well, it's going to have more success if we've lowered the pressure to begin with. When we're going to talk about oh, supplying some nutrition, some calcium, some silicon, we're going to talk about these, this, that, or the other. Well, these imperfect tools are going to have more success if we start with a foundation of a little bit more diversity. So for me, this one is really foundational, and then we layer these next couple on top. So let's dive into micro, um, the biology and how microbiology uh, and a healthy soil biology can also help in this discussion. Now, you'd all be familiar with the disease triangle, the classic idea that we have, in order for disease outbreak, we need a host, the host plant, we have to have the pathogen present, and we have to have the environmental conditions, the right environmental conditions. And when we have host plant and pathogen and the right environmental conditions, this creates the opportunity for disease outbreak. And you might have the host and the pathogen. Pathogens are always there. Forget this crazy idea that we apply fungicides and things to as sterilants to sterilize the system. We're never sterilizing the system. There is always pathogens present. Um, it's, they're always there. You can never get rid of them. We have to kind of lose that idea. It's about managing them there. And that's that point about the environment. You can have them present, but not necessarily causing disease or causing disease at an economic threshold. So, however, if the environment, the high humidity or something, if the environment is there, okay, now we have the right environmental conditions for the pathogen to then cause disease. And that's that classic idea. You need the three parts. That's the disease triangle. That's all good. Apart from, it completely ignores the role and the contribution of the soil microbiome, of those microbes, the beneficial microbes that live in that soil. Completely ignores it. It's not to say that the disease triangle is wrong. It's just that it is incomplete. It's half the story. Because those beneficial microbes in the soil, they can interact with that plant and strengthen its immunity and help it fight off that disease or the insect attack. Those beneficial microbes can eat the pathogens or suppress the pathogens. They interact. And the classic disease triangle does not factor that in whatsoever. And so a good, healthy soil biology can tip the scales, can tip the balance. It's not just about host, pathogen, and environment. It's also about how all of those beneficial organisms are interacting and tipping the scales um, when we have optimized soil health. And that's the opportunity that's why we need to focus, and we are all getting interested and excited in, about soil biology in recent years, because they can make a contribution to the picture, to this discussion. Uh, and yes, they're very complex. Yes, we're still unpacking them and understanding them. There's lots and lots of things we don't know about them. Um, they bring that challenge, most certainly. But it is very clear that they can make a contribution to the overall picture. So it is right that we are focusing in on them at the moment, trying to fill some of the knowledge gaps, trying to understand better how, why, and when they do this, and how we can kind of adjust our management to support them um, in doing that. So I, I encourage you to kind of go beyond that classic um, idea of the soil health triangle, uh, the, uh, the disease triangle. 
So how do microbes, uh, how do organisms suppress pathogens in this example? It's, you know, some of these are pretty straightforward. Competition. Uh, if you fill up the car park with a lot of beneficial microbes, there's just no space for the pathogen to enter the party, you know, to join the party. So competition, competing for moisture, for space, for nutrients. Let's out-compete those pathogens with the beneficials, make it harder for them. But then those beneficials can also produce a whole range of biochemicals. So they excrete all sorts of antifungal, antibiotic type substances onto the around the plant, onto the leaf or around that root system. And these biochemicals then can also have suppressive effects on the pathogens. So that we have a second layer through this um, these anti that's called antibiosis there, or these biochemical antagonisms. And then we have predation. Some of these organisms' soil eat pathogens. So we have things like trichoderma. Some of you might have heard of that one. It's a predatory fungus, a fungus that eats other fungus. So it can eat the disease-causing fungus. We also have some of our larger insects. I'll share a study in a second. Um, some of our soil insects, actually, and protozoa are also, who eat disease spores. They eat them for their nutrition. So we have predation happening. And again, we need good, functioning, healthy soils for to see these benefits. Um, and then lastly, many of these beneficial microbes can also help the plant fuel its own immune system. The plant can produce defense chemicals, but it needs some of the microbes to help it do that. So that gives us kind of these two schools of thought about biology. Uh, we have one that says, well, let's just feed who's there. Let's support the native biology. Let's just build a nice home for them, follow the soil health principles, minimize disturbance, keep the soil covered, feed that soil with root exudates, etc., living roots. Just feed who's there, look after who's there. Um, that's kind of one school of thought. Another school of thought says, well, is there an opportunity here to introduce new microbes, apply inoculants, um, use kind of cultures and starters to kind of kickstart the system um, to maybe reinvigorate the organisms that's there. And I personally hold a middle ground view on this. I think both are relevant. I do agree that we have to, at a foundation level, we have to start with taking care of who's already there. That means you have to kind of implement some of those soil health principles and get the soil functioning. There's no point in introducing other microbial inoculants if your soil is compact, has poor organic matter, not very functional. Those organisms aren't going to survive and thrive. So sure, I think at a base level, we have to think about just feeding the natives, working with the natives. But sure, I'm open to inoculating um, some new organisms to kind of maybe speed up that process or kickstart that process. And my personal preference on this is that if you're going to put microbes into the system, if you're going to apply them, I know this is kind of debated on both sides. Many think it's no point and a waste of time. But if you're going to, I would prioritize putting them on the seed or in the furrow. Because trying to kind of broadcast them on the soil or dilute them through the soil this is kind of one of the big critiques. People say, well, it's a spit in the ocean. You're putting these few millions of organisms into this soil profile of bazillion, bazillion organisms. It's a drop in the ocean. It's like saying, I'm going to spit in the ocean and we're going to raise sea level. But that's not the goal. You're not using these microbial inoculants to try necessarily and change the soil biome. You're trying to change the plant biome. You want to put it around the seed or in that furrow where when that plant germinates and grows, those organisms will be there to grow with that root system. And they will then grow with that root system if that plant recruits them. And if the plant is releasing that root ex the right root exudates to culture them and have them grow with the root system, then they will. And that's really what you're trying to change. You're trying to manage the plant biome during that cropping phase, during that growth cycle or that growth stage. That's really what you're trying to do. And at the end of that, you might harvest that crop and it goes to death and it dies and it finishes, ripens, you harvest it, and all of those organisms that you put down are now dead. And that doesn't make that process a waste of time. Why is the metric have to be that microbes need to persist forever as to be the metric of success? They did their thing at that time while the plant was in the season, and that can be successful. And it may not be a waste of time just because they die off at the end of the season, like a lot of things are dying off, if the plant is dying off, the plant's stopping to feed a whole lot of microorganisms in that soil. A lot of them are now dead. Anyway, that's part of the cycle. So it's just a nuance. We're not necessarily trying to change the soil biome per se. We're trying to kind of manage and work with that plant biome. 
uh, this was a study I just mentioned that um, no rest for resting spores can pred predators mitigate okay, club root disease in this example. So yes, we have all these examples, be it protozoa or some of the micro insects, uh, mi yeah, microarthropods, micro insects, or some of the other things like protozoa or nematodes. Some of these guys can eat pathogen spores and literally consume them for their nutrition. Um, so there are, in a, if we optimize soil biology in that broader sense, optimize soil health in that broader sense, yes, we are introducing other mechanisms by which um, the organisms there can help lower the disease pressure, lower, lower the spore load, for example. So then we talk about feeding native biology. Yeah, it's a lot of those same carbon sources we talked about earlier with the foliar sprays. It's molasses, sugars, fish, seaweeds, protein hydrolysates, humix, fulvix, plant extracts. Yeah, organic amendments, any composts, manures, um, diversity, plants, cover crops, plants, photosynthesis. What happens with all those photosynthates? They get translocated down to the roots and pumped out as root exudates. This right here is the preferred food source for microorganisms. If you want to increase your soil biology, it's really easy. Just grow a plant. If you grow a plant, it's going to photosynthesize, breathe in all that carbon, pump it down into the soil as those root exudates, and you're feeding soil biology. And they love those root exudates. It's their preferred, preferred food source. Yeah, all these are great too, and I support all of these. Um, but so, so does cover crops. So does d diverse plant mixtures. These are all great ways to use roots and root exudates to feed biology. But sure, maybe integrate um, quite a few of those. So like that's how we could feed biology, just take care of who's there. If you want to introduce new populations, you can buy a whole range of commercial products out there. There's a never-ending list of these. Um, so I think they have a time and a place. You can also make your own, do some DIY things like compost, uh, compost extracts, some of these kind of bioferment type things, indigenous microbes. Um, making your own mycorrhiza is possible, but it's quite labor intensive. But, you know, some of these kind of more easier ones. Um, if I were looking at this list, yes, I would recommend that we, sh if we're going to introduce new microbes, yes, I think that we should start with the DIY ones. The ones that you manufacture yourselves on your farm, in your micro environment. The organisms that end up growing there are clearly adapted to, the, to that environment where you live, on your farm. So make your own microbials. They're going to be better suited to your soil type and your local context. So yes, I would start here as a primary. But sure, is there an opportunity for commercial products, lab-based cultures? Sure, they can be very specific and targeted in their approach. If you specifically want phosphorylizing organisms or nitrogen fixes, yes, you know exactly what's in there. Um, you can target that. So yeah, I think they have their place. Um, some of the lab cultures have various benefits. You can you know what's in there. They culture them in um, in sterile conditions, so we know it's kind of clean. Uh, some of those kind of strains that they select for are generally quite hardy strains. So meaning if you're going to spend a lot of money on commercializing a product, you want to know that that strain is going to survive in a lot of different environments. So they often will be selecting very specific strains that are a bit more durable in across a range of pHs, soil pHs, for example. So there are some benefits to the lab cultures. I think they have their time and place. I support them. But I would personally, I think we should start with kind of getting a bit of native biology. If you're making compost in your farm, like you're getting lots of native local biology that's thriving there, it's going to have more chance of surviving in your soil once you apply it. So I lean that way too. So that's my hierarchy. I would start with feeding the natives. Keep that soil covered. Root exudates. Stimulate who's there. Definitely. Foundational. Soil health principles. Start there. Then if you're going to make your, then if you're going to use inoculants, make your own, then I would buy them in as a third piece of that puzzle. Um, and can they control disease? Let's use one of them, compost extracts. Look, again, they're not perfect. They're imperfect tools. They do not usually always control disease. But can they reduce disease? Can they have a suppressive effect? Can they be another tool in the toolbox? Absolutely, yes. And we have lots of evidence in the studies that show that pretty much most of the main um, plant diseases, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Verticillium, Fusarium, Sclerotinia, Phytophthora, I can show you many papers that show that compost extracts at least have some suppressive abilities against these diseases. Again, I'm not saying they provide 100% control. They usually don't. But they can provide some level of control. And when you layer that on top of 
a intercrop, a companion crop, a genetic diversity cultivar mix. Hey, now this imperfect tool layered on top of another imperfect tool starts to have meaningful effect, have meaningful suppression. So I think I'm, I don't mind that they're not perfect. Uh, I think it's an integrated approach. That's the point of bringing many tools together. And that's why I think even on a small scale, the things like the David Johnson bioreactor, even like quite small scales, this is kind of small scale, but premium, high quality compost, takes a bit of a long time, but it produces a very microbially diverse compost, um, which you can then small amounts make an extract with and put that on your seed or inject that into the furrow. So even smallish scales, a tote of this kind of scale, okay, you're going to need a few, quite a few of these for most farms, but you can produce enough extract this way to treat that seed. Um, it is a, it is practical, it is scalable. And I think that, I'm sure you all know the bioreactor, you can find plenty of information online, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's just an example of where I think it is um, practical, it can form a, a piece of the puzzle um, as part of that kind of discussion. So um, let's kind of from there steer into a, a few comments on nutrition. Um, I want to then cover just the key nutrients as a third piece that we can kind of layer on top of this. Um, and then we'll kind of finish this section here and then we'll take a, a coffee break. I think will be a good time. So there's kind of lots we could really dive into. Here. We could go heaps into this conversation, but I'm kind of just going to cherry pick the key takeaway messages for you, the key kind of points to, to kind of... Um, um, manage this one. So again, it comes back to photosynthesis. It is about plant growth, taking carbon, that, that food, that stuff of life, combining with water, with the energy from the sun, and growing plants. But remember, it's not just about this magic, beautiful little reaction here. We also need one other key ingredient. It's those nutrients, that manure that macro and micronutrients, they are the catalysts of this process. And those same nutrients not only catalyze photosynthesis, but they also catalyze the production of defense chemicals. They take that carbon, that glucose, that building block, and they shuttle that glucose through different metabolic pathways that cleave on and off various different things and reshape it into different chemicals, into different biochemicals. They turn that carbon sugar into all sorts of other things. Okay, and that's really the idea. So when we talk about photosynthesis, as we did already, plant growth, we talked about this one. It's the second step that I'm particularly talking about now. It's about taking the building block and turning it into defense chemicals, chemicals that can suppress pathogens and, and insects, protective compounds, structural barriers, things that help to protect that plant. Because when the plant is under attack from a pest, uh, from a disease. Of course, it does not just jump on up out of the ground and run away. It can't do that like an animal can. So plants have to defend themselves with chemicals, with biochemicals. So they have these metabolic pathways to turn photosynthetic products into a whole array and suite of all sorts of other bioactive compounds. And that is their defense. It's all through chemistry through these biochemicals. So that's what we're really trying to encourage. And again, just to remind you that they're all really important in doing this. And we're going to cherry pick out some of the key ones from this um, immunity point of view. But again, I layer that to say that um, they're all really important. So if we think about this slide again, and I emphasize the need to supply nutrients to catalyze this and to catalyze this, and this is great, this is needed for optimum growth, for production if you want to increase yield, if you want to increase protein quality, you've got to optimize the nutrients for plant growth, for quality, etc. But if you want to optimize plant health against, say, insect attack, it looks like this. It's the same, but we're now going to turn that building block just into different things antifeedants, things that upset the digestive system of the insects that make them um, anti-herbivory type effects. Other cell strengtheners, the structural barriers, make the skin on the plant thicker, tougher, harder for the insect to chew through. Um, some of these other volatile organic compounds that I mentioned, these deterrent chemicals, th gases, things that waft off into the air that make the plant invisible, that attract in the predator. These are all these various other defense mechanisms, these protective compounds, etc. 
But again, if you don't have the right nutrients to catalyze their production, you're not going to be fueling this immune response in the plant. It's not, the plant's not going to have the resources to build those defense chemicals. What about disease? What does that look like? It's the same. You've still got to optimize primary photosynthesis. You've still got to get the building block. And again, what were those five key nutrients that are important for that primary photosynthesis? Can anyone remember? Molybdenum. Okay, it wasn't molybdenum wasn't on the list for primary photosynthesis. Magne uh, magnesium. You might have been thinking magnesium, sir. Magnesium. What was attached to magnesium again? Nitrogen. All right. There was something there that helped to build that chlorophyll molecule. Iron. Good man. All right. There's two more. Manganese for water and what? Well, carbon. You need carbon from the air. Phosphorus. Energy. Yeah. Phosphorus. Yeah. Okay. Good. You were listening. So you've got to have that, but then now we're just going to turn that building block into some different stuff. Other my, um, microbial, antifungal, antimicrobial, antibiotic type uh, substances, okay, and other structural barriers. So these types of things, different volatiles that can also affect diseases. Okay, but again, we've just got to optimize the right nutrients um, for that for that process. Okay, so that's essentially the the idea. So what are some of the plant defenses? We have physical, primary defenses, and then we have secondary. So physical defenses is this, this idea of the skin on the plant. This is what we're trying to thicken up or toughen up. And there's all sorts of things that kind of sit in here. Those kind of waxes we talked about, um, lignin, callus. This is kind of like a callus on our fingers, these types of things. And what really, these are kind of these structural compounds, pectins, cellulose, lignans, that kind of really reinforce this kind of layer here, this epidermal layer in the plant. But then we also have the cell walls here, and this is the other one. So we can thicken up these with kind of structural compounds, and then we can deposit that calcium, that silicon and boron right here in these cell walls. So these are our physical defenses toughening up the skin of the plant. And then we have the internal compounds. These are those defense chemicals, these systemic things that are circulating around that can have these bioactive substances that can also suppress um, again, be distasteful to an insect or suppress um, microorganisms, uh, pathogens. Now, these biochemical defenses, again, like I emphasize, we need the right nutrients, the essential macro and micronutrients to build those. But some of these are also very special where we, this is where biology and nutrition intersect, where we also need biology to also prime or trigger or signal the production of some of these defense chemicals as well. And we have some fascinating examples of this, and I'll give you a quick one here. So when the plant is under attack, uh, disease or insect starts chewing, of course the plant senses and detects that, and it sends a whole lot of stress signals down to the roots, and actually the plant will change its root exudate profile. It will release all sorts of stress-related signals, a cry for help, and it pumps out very specific root exudates that will activate and recruit certain microbes from the bulk soil who will help that plant mount its defenses, who will help that plant fuel its immune system. So first it changes the root exudation profile, it sends all these stress-related signals out, and then our, um, our friends here come to the call, um, our beneficial microbes, they start to be recruited, they start to grow all over that root system because the plant has recruited them. It releases a specific root exudate that that microbe likes, so now the food source is there, it starts to grow and multiply. So it's just the, the plant is recruiting it. And then when those microbes, beneficials, start to grow all over that root system, there are two things that happen here. One is more direct, one is more indirect. So firstly, those microbes that the plant specifically recruits, they start to grow, multiply, and as they do that, they also start to excrete all sorts of their own their, their equivalent of root exudates, so their microbial metabolites, their microbial byproducts, their microbial exudates, they pump out all sorts of biochemicals into their environment as well. That's what all microbes do. So those microbes that are recruited start to produce all sorts of biochemicals. And some of those biochemicals are directly absorbed by the root. So the plant will actually take them up and they can be systemically translocated throughout the plant where they will then be sent up um, uh, translocated through the leaf to then provide the biochemical protection against um, either of those 
um, pest or pathogen. So they are supplying the defense chemical. We also have a more indirect pathway where those chemicals, some of those chemicals that the microbes release are not the bioactive substance per se, but they are a signaling molecule. They are another chemical, a special chemical, that then when the plant detects, can actually induce unique and specific genetic expression in the plant. And I'm talking very specific here. So there are genes in the plant that are that the plant has, but it can't unlock that it needs those microbes and that specific compound that that microbe releases to then be detected by the root, and that detection triggers the expression of a particular gene that the plant has. And that gene usually codes for a defense chemical that then rushes to the site, is translocated to the site of infection, where again it provides protection. But this is something that the plant has, but it's using the microbe to unlock. And I don't really have a perfect explanation as to exactly why wouldn't the plant just turn it on itself? Why, why can't the plant just turn switch that gene on um, and make that defense chemical? And I don't really have a good, a good answer apart from just guessing that you know, plants and microbes have lived together for a long time. They've co-evolved together, for, uh, depending on your school of thought here, but maybe a couple of thousand years, maybe a couple of million years, you know, whatever. I don't mind. Um, they've worked together for a long time, and I think it's really just a partition of labor. Why does the plant need to hold on to all of the keys to unlock these genes? Um, that's a lot of kind of compounds there when it doesn't need them all the time. It's not an everyday growth. It's not an everyday enzyme that it needs every day to photosynthesize, to turn that nitrate in. It's not something it always needs. It only needs it when it's under attack. So therefore, it's drawing on all of the genetics in that soil microbiome. And there's a whole lot more genetics in the soil microbiome than there is in the plant. And so the plant is then using that as a repository to kind of, and a bank to kind of draw from, and it will then activate them, get the expression of the compound, trigger the genetic expression, unleash the, the defense chemical, and off it goes. Like We have examples in literature of if it being that specific. The relationship really is that specific um, with a specific pest and microbe and the plant, kind of the interface in between those. So it's very interesting. But that aside, we still need nutrition. Because even if the bacteria or the microbes here are triggering this expression and the, the plant is switching on that gene, it still needs the nutrients, it still needs the resources to build the catalyst, to build that enzyme. Okay, It still needs the moly or the copper or the whatever it's going to be. So you, nutrition is still a foundation, but it also works then with biology there in that example. They go together um, hand in glove. So that's really some of the kind of the mechanisms there. I know in some circles this idea that nutrition can um, ma control, manage disease, pest and disease might be more of a fringe idea. You know, this idea that, oh, we can optimize plant health and healthy plants are resistant to, to pest and disease. Some might not totally believe in that kind of whole idea. Um, it might be more of a fringe idea in some circles. But just so you're aware, if you dive into the scientific literature and look at the links, nutritional links with nutritional deficiencies and those making plants more vulnerable to pests and disease, um, just so you're aware, in the literature, there is very good evidence to support this. It is not a really a fringe idea at all. There are lots and lots. This is a small, small selection. There are hundreds of studies that show that when a plant is nutritionally deficient, of course, it's a bit dysregulated. It's not functioning properly. This opens it up to being more vulnerable to attack. It is not a weird or fringe idea. It is very well established. There are many papers, many studies that show this. This is a tiny, tiny selection. This is not the weird problem. This is not the weird idea. This is not the problem we have faced. I acknowledge the real challenge is the practical application of this evidence. It's about, well, what nutrient and what time, what form of that nutrient, what time do I need, how much do I need, how do I get that into the plant? These are the real challenges that I'm happy to acknowledge we got a lot of knowledge gaps on. Uh, it, it's not perfect. This is also an imperfect tool, but it is a tool and there is good evidence to support the potential of nutrition to be a piece of this puzzle. We can optimize plant health through optimized nutrition. It's not a fringe idea whatsoever. 
um, there are many good examples. And if anyone's interested, like this is one book that's maybe a bit more easily accessible to you all. It is quite expensive, but this is one book that kind of brings some of that together. Mineral nutrition and plant disease, kind of cataloging a whole host of different diseases and the nutritional links that are established in the literature. There's lots of them out there. You could kind of find some of these. Let me give you an example of um, um, the practical challenge. Um, and this is on cucumbers and grass houses may not be relevant per se for you, but I, it's a nice example of kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, here we're looking at manganese to manage mildew on cucumbers. And I'll read you um, a few quotes here. Foliar application of manganese is an effective factor in enhancing plant resistance to fungal diseases. But the efficiency of this method strongly depends on the application time. So they're not suggesting that manganese applications to control mildew is a far out and weird idea. They're suggesting that the challenge is managing the timing of these applications. So what they found is that good levels of manganese in the plant led to a significant reduction in fungal disease. The highest reduction in disease severity was observed when manganese solutions were applied at four days before infection. The cucumber plants treated by manganese at four days before infection accumulated the highest levels of manganese in their leaves, higher than those treated at 14, 10, or seven days before infection. So here they're demonstrating that if you applied that manganese two weeks ago, and then you happen to get an infection, that manganese was not at high enough levels to provide protection because you applied it two weeks ago and it has been metabolized, utilized, translocated, and it wasn't enough there to provide that protection. Whereas if you had applied it four days beforehand, you had fresh high magnesium in that leaf and then the pathogen comes, you have control. So it's not the idea that manganese can control disease or not, it's that the timing of that application was critical in the success of that. So of course one farmer tries it at two weeks earlier and he walks away from this saying, Oh man, this idea that nutrition can control disease is a load of, you know what? And the other farmer who did it at four days says, oh wow, something really worked here. This really did. So it's, I give this as an example of the practical challenges that we face because how do you know what day you're going to get infection? So how do you know how many days before you've got to apply that manganese? You know, so of course, look, there's practical challenges. We've got knowledge gaps to fill, but it is not the idea in itself. So um, let's dive into some of the key kind of nutrients. Um, I'll share this one and then I'll get into some kind of practicals here. One more for you. Just again to show you know that there's lots of like good reviews and studies on this. Roles of nutrients in controlling plant diseases. Um, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here when there's high levels of nitrogen, increase in disease severity. Potassium decreases the susceptibility of the host plants. Manganese can control a number of diseases because of manganese's role in lignin biosynthesis, the skin of the plant, and plus also some of those other biochemicals, those systemic chemicals. Boron was found to reduce severity of many diseases because of boron increases the cell wall strength. And silicon has been shown to control a number of diseases because silicon also helps to create that physical barrier and also produce some of these internal compounds. So um, I summarize some of that literature into this slide. I think these are my key um, nutrients to consider if you're really trying to make healthy plants against pests and disease. These are the key ones that I would particularly focus on. Calcium, silicon, and boron, as I mentioned, all three of those are deposited in those cell walls and they interlink with each other, forming this tight knit structure that really increases the rigidity, that robustness of those cell walls, making it harder for pathogens um, and insects to chew through. So, those for cell strength. In terms of the other structural compounds on the skin, toughening up the structural compounds, it's like the lignin, um, these types of things that I mentioned. It's manganese, it's copper, and again, boron. These are the three that play a particularly important role in some of this lignin and structural barrier synthesis. And then in terms of some of those internal systemic chemicals, uh, biochemicals, again, silicon is a really important signaling molecule in this discussion, helping the plant kind of switch on, signal around the plant to switch on the production of defense chemicals. So silicon plays a really important one here. Again, manganese has a dual role internally through some of these systemic chemicals. And also sulfur, as you know, sulfur, um, the brassicas, why do we use a lot of brassicas in 
cover crops or sometimes for like the soil fumigation benefits. It's because they're rich in these sulfur bearing compounds, which I'm sure you've come across those glucosinolates or the isothiocyanates. Um, these are sulfur bearing chemicals that have kind of strong kind of fungicidal and bio um, antibiotic type properties. So sulfur is another uh, good one um, that helps some of these internal systemic defense chemicals. And then an imbalance of nitrogen is the other big one. And that's the one I want to um, also make sure we spend a bit of time um, in our last kind of little 10 minutes or so here before break, um, spending some time on this discussion of nitrogen because it plugs in very much to our earlier conversation this morning. So nitrogen, excess nitrogen, is also one of the major culprits of pest and disease pressure. We push nitrogen for yield. I understand you need to pay the bills. I understand you need to get a good yield. But we over apply and or we apply too much at one time, inducing imbalances. And it's, I'll acknowledge it's not just too much nitrogen. It's too much nitrogen in relation to those other synergistic nutrients that help nitrogen work. That's also the subtlety. I think that's a little more the problem. And I share this one with you. If anyone wants to, this is an open access paper. If anyone wants to dive into this one, it's quite interesting. Um, when medicine feeds the problem, do nitrogen fertilizers and pesticides enhance the nutritional quality of crops for their pests and pathogens? This is a very interesting paper that basically brings together the evidence to lay out that says when you have plants that have too much nitrogen in them or too much nitrogen in relation to some of those synergistic nutrients, that nitrogen accumulates in the wrong form. And this is really talking about inadequate protein synthesis, when that metabolic pathway that we talked about this morning is not fully functional and we don't achieve good protein, complex and complete protein synthesis, we have an accumulation of some of those other forms of nitrogen which ultimately are not what the plant wants and ultimately weaken the plant. And that's the essence of the idea. So too much nitrogen um, can make the plant particularly what they demonstrate here and share the evidence on this, accumulate too many free amino acids. Now, I was talking about amino acids earlier as being very favorable, uh, organic nitrogen, and they are, and the plant does want those, but really what it wants is the next step. It's the complete and complex proteins. That is the, the money shot. Like That's what it's really chasing. The amino acids are the building blocks to make those proteins. So yes, we want amino acids compared to some of those other inorganic forms. We definitely want them up in the organic fraction, but getting them to amino acids is not quite enough. We've got to turn those into the proteins. And the reason is, is that amino acids, I'm sure you've heard this saying before, amino acids are the building blocks of life. This is a common thing we talk about. The amino acids all stitch together to form proteins, all sorts of different proteins. So that means that all of us as humans, as people, we like to eat food and we break it down into the amino acids so that we can, we can re-stitch those amino acids together to make human proteins, things humans need and want. A bacteria also loves amino acids because it loves to build those amino acids and stitch them into bacterial proteins, things bacteria need. Fungi do the same building blocks but make fungal proteins. Insects need amino acids and they like to build insect things, proteins that insects need. Live cattle need it, chickens need it. We all need amino acids. They are the building blocks of life. We are all competing for amino acids. Everyone wants amino acids, but it's just what do we do with them is a bit different thereafter. So when we have too much nitrogen in the system, and therefore we accumulate some of these free amino acids that can't finish the job into the plant proteins, those amino acids begin to accumulate. And this makes the plant very attractive to pathogens who need those amino acids too, to build pathogen proteins, or insects who need those amino acids to build insect proteins. So that's the essence, and they lay out the evidence to support this, that too much nitrogen enriches the plant with too, too, too much nitrogen application, enriches the plant with too much nitrogen, too much free amino acids, that can then make the um, plant more attractive to that insect pest. There's another part to it as well in relation to defense chemicals, some of those defense chemicals. There are kind of two main classes of some of the defense chemicals, nitrogen bearing defense chemicals or just carbon, carbon bearing defense chemicals, ones without any nitrogen. And when we over apply nitrogen, yes, this actually does 
increase the production of some of those nitrogen-bearing defense chemicals. So if your particular insect pest is susceptible to some of the nitrogen-bearing defense chemicals, because as you know, there's different chemicals, ones that we apply, they have a specific mode of action. There are specific chemicals, specific mode of action that will control a specific pest. Some pests, some plant organisms are not susceptible to that mode of action, so it doesn't affect them. That's the same idea. Every chemical is specific. So some of the nitrogen-bearing chemicals, plant chemicals, are um, very effective at certain insect pests. So when we over-apply nitrogen, we increase the production of those. That can be a good thing if the pest that we're facing is susceptible to that nitrogen-bearing defense chemical. But the other side of this coin is that when we over-apply nitrogen, we increase these chemicals, but we decrease the non-nitrogen-bearing, the carbon-bearing defense chemicals, they get suppressed because we have too much nitrogen. So if your insect pest is the one that's susceptible to one of these carbon-bearing defense chemicals, then actually that nitrogen will then suppress plant immunity. So it's not that all nitrogen is bad. Sometimes some nitrogen can be good to encourage the right defense chemical for that pest. That can be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing if it is suppressing the production of the carbon-based defense chemical. So it really, it's a bit of a nuance and um, it kind of depends. But the, the overall kind of picture there is the other part is what we were talking about before. It's this accumulation of amino acids. It's the inability to finish this last step. And that's where these nutrients become really important. So you've got, again, phos, sulfur, magnesium, really important for final protein synthesis, as well as these couple of others. So if these start to accumulate, this becomes insect food, pathogen food. But once we optimize this and get the protein synthesis, now the insects don't like this. They can't digest this, bacteria, etc. They're not so attracted to this. This is the stuff of life. This is the building block of life. That's what they all want. So I would, the, the, the language that this article uses is high nitrogen. High nitrogen leads to, high nitrogen application leads to amino acid accumulation, making the plants more attractive. I personally would bring another layer to this. I would say, is it excess nitrogen or is it insufficient synergies, inefficient nutrients in the red boxes there? Because you might have high nitrogen, but if you've got all of the right catalysts and enzymes there to shuttle that into complete protein, that would be good. So I don't think it's just high nitrogen. It's high nitrogen in relation to those other nutrients. And I think that's the kind of the, tea, the key take home message. Now, what about the pesticides? They also say that our pesticide applications can also lead to an enrichment of amino acids, uh, which ultimately, again, makes the plant more attracted to those insect pests. Now, of course, as you know, pesticides, they do suppress the natural enemies. So there's another pathway there that, of course, we know about. We are suppressing the natural and can suppress some of those natural enemies. So that's also making it easier for the insect pests to take a hold. But there is this point that pesticides can enrich amino acids in the plant. And this is because of a stress response. When the plant is stressed, and I'm talking all sorts of stresses here, it could be drought stress, could be frost stress, heat stress, disease attack, insect attack, salt stress, all sorts of stresses. When the plant is stressed, that induces something called protein breakdown, protein catabolism. Because what the plant does is breaks down protein. These are kind of like maybe some storage kind of proteins that it will break them down back into those amino acids. So the, so the pathway does not always go that way. It can come this way. And this is called protein breakdown where proteins are breaking down, protein catabolism where they break down back to the amino acids. And plants do this when they're stressed because they take those storage proteins and they liberate, free up those amino acids. They break them down so that they can take those amino acids and re-stitch them together into different proteins. And for example, if there's a cold snap, they will liberate aminos and make a different protein, a cold resistant protein. Or if it's a heat wave, they'll make these special proteins that help them tolerate that heat. If it's a really high UV and hot sun, they'll liberate and make proteins that help them deal with that. They're doing this all of the time. They're responding to the environment constantly. So the point here is, is that when we apply a pesticide, although it's not going to kill the plant, okay, so I'm talking here selective herbicide, it's not going to kill the plant. If you apply a fungicide, it's not going to kill the plant. 
but we are still putting chemicals into the plant which it does not love or thrive on. So it has to detoxify them. It will just mobilize its detoxification processes, break them down into other metabolic byproducts. And that detoxification, dox, detoxification process is dependent on liberating some amino acids and build, rebuilding them into detox proteins. So it's specialized proteins which can cut up and break down the pesticide. So you've all seen it before, I'm sure. When you apply a, a pesticide, sometimes the plants look a bit unhappy for a few days, maybe stress a little bit for a couple of days, and then they pull through it. And what you're seeing there is the detoxification. The plant stops growing. Okay, I have to prioritize det detox. So it takes the storage proteins, it liberates amino acids, it rebuilds some detox proteins. So it goes through that process of breakdown so that it can rearrange those amino acids into different proteins, detox proteins, which it then can rebuild and then detox. And once it does that, then it carries on growing. So that little stress response that you're seeing is just this little um, process of kind of shock and stress, which is a process of protein breakdown to then deal with whatever, the, to rebuild the tools that it needs to deal with the problem and then move on. So that's what the paper again shares the evidence to support this that highlights that plants don't love some of our pesticides. It's not going to kill them. They can deal with it, but they don't love it. So they're doing this detoxification process. And in doing so, we liberate, temporarily, we liberate proteins and induce a process of free amino acids. So that stress response is leading to an accumulation of these amino acids, thereby making the plant more attractive, again, to the insect pest. So practically speaking, one of the great ways we can help to manage this is to include some amino acids with your pesticide applications so that the plant won't do this. If you put some external fresh amino acids in, the plant doesn't have to break down all these other ones. It's got fresh available amino acids that it can immediately turn into those detox proteins. So just combine aminos with pesticides. You'll help to alleviate this stress response. And here's a great example on Roundup Ready Soys. With glyphosate, they just combine some amino acids. As a so we have a treatment of control, just glyphosate, and on our treatment we have glyphosate plus amino acids on soybeans. Because glyphosate interferes with amino acid synthesis, supplementation with exogenous or external amino acids may help uh, glyphosate-resistant soybeans recover from the adverse effects of the glyphosate. In so then they measured a bunch of like photosynthetic properties and plant growth-related um, variables in the two treatments. And in general, the photosynthetic variables, the nutrient contents, the shoot and root dry biomass parameters were all affected by glyphosate. However, the use of amino acid formulations suppressed these harmful effects of glyphosate on those various parameters. So wherever they included the aminos, the plant tolerance was higher. It just it maintained higher pho photosynthetic activity. It grew through that stress. It had less effect, less negative effects. So that's really the idea, is just simply to um, include some aminos with your pesticides. Okay, so in summary, we took a quick tour. There are three key areas. Let's start with de designing with diversity. Just start on the right foot. Get a bit more diversity into the system so that the disease and insects don't spread like wildfire. Then we could potentially use some biologicals, optimize your soil health, Maybe make your own inoculants, buy some in if you need um, to provide biological protection. And then you've got to think about the nutrition as well. The, the key nutrients there, the calcium, silicon boron, some of those nutrients that are the um, resources that build those, um, those enzymes. So in summary, we want to integrate many tools as possible. That's what integrated management is all about. Diversity, biology, nutrition, the physical protection there, calcium, silicon, boron, manganese and copper, the biochemical protection. I didn't talk about there's calcium's kind of dual, also calcium is there, silicon, manganese, nitrogen, we just talked about that there at the end, sulfur we talked about, potassium and zinc also play a role. I acknowledge there are many knowledge gaps, okay? The timings, what are the timings, the rates, the forms, what is the optimized nutrition, what is the right microbe, how do I apply it, what time? Yes, there are knowledge gaps. I acknowledge that. That's where we need to focus. 
Not on the debate of whether or not this is effective or not, there is plenty of evidence to support these concepts. What we really need to be working on in terms of research agenda is the practical application. Use plant analysis, I think, therefore, to monitor some of those nutritional imbalances. If you have a nutritional imbalance, you can't build the chemical. You can't build the defense chemical if you don't have the mineral. So nutrition, I think, really, really is a key foundation there. And as we touched on this morning, foliars can be a way then to um, quickly get those address those deficiency symptoms and get those nutrients into the plant uh, in order to optimize that process. Okay. Any burning questions on that one before we have a coffee? Yeah. I, I would use a combination of both because, yes, of course, glyphosate is uh, chelating up that manganese as well. So I would use a bit of both. I would put some manganese with aminos. Yeah. They're very good accumulators of it, yes, and then so their residues um, will leave some of that in an organic form. So yes, they would help to accumulate it and then leave some behind. They are good at that. And at, or whether or not you've got scope to have them as a companion, that maybe even gets terminated out, and then as it dies and decays, I'm going to show you a really good example of this uh, in the last presentation. But um, So as a companion, when they then die and decay, they're releasing those nutrients that they accumulated. So a brassica companion that could then be controlled at a later date could also be a good strategy. Um, or a, yeah, a brassica in the rotation or any brassicas in a cover crop or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so the question was any examples of foliars on native grasses or pastures in order to... Um, help with this. Um, maybe not so much on native grasses, but I can certainly say over in Europe, I know many farmers uh, who are doing foliars on pasture systems, particularly in dairy, but also in beef. Um, and yes, they are achieving excellent reductions in soil, particularly nitrogen here, reductions in soil applied nitrogen. Many of the farmers there are about hovering around about 50% of what they used to use as soil doing a, and, and, there is pastures are an example crop that I've seen where farmers are doing a 100% foliar program and it, and it does work. It's a special kind of crop. It's got a, a lot of density, a lot of leaf coverage. So you've got a lot of canopy there, a lot of surface area to catch that foliar. And so there are many farmers there um, who are achieving anywhere from 40, 50 to 60% reductions um, in nitrogen compared to what they used to do on soil. So yes, I think in intensive systems, seeing it work very, very well. Um, with your natives, I guess I would proceed a little bit more with caution in terms of maybe not going so high on the application rates, maybe lower doses just to kind of help them on. Some of our natives generally don't always love such high nutrient environments, so maybe I'd go lower doses on, on something like that. Yeah. Uh, I'll, just in case anybody can't hear it at the back or for the recording, I'll just repeat the question. But um, so the question was there about um, all those different forms of nitrogen. How do we can we visually assess whether we have too much nitrates or urea or whatnot? How do we really unpack um, and exactly determine what forms of nitrogen the plant has? Because if it has lots of nitrogen in there in the wrong form, it can still look green and nice or healthy in that sense. Um, how do we really determine that? Can we do it without, is a SAP analysis the only way or not? And I would say that um, with the nitrate example, it's a special example where you can get an inkling that the plant's quite full of nitrates 
it has more of a blue green color uh, I would say that's a particular special example where it, you can it has this more shade of blue and you'd if you kind of yeah if you saw a few side by side you'd pick it really easy so there is a kind of a blue tone and that's very nitrate green and nitrate green but the but the premise of your question is correct it's very difficult otherwise and yes I do think that that's where the sap analysis um, is great value because it breaks apart those different forms you can also use a you know in field sap and that meter uh, there is a nitrate meter we can measure that one specifically so you can like a bricks meter or refractometer you can collect some leads crush some sap and measure the nitrates on an immediate reading little handheld meter so that one again you could also um, tap into and that I think, is useful to mon monitor nitrates to make sure that they're not high to keep them low so to know when you need to maybe apply some molly kind of thing um, so you can use those or the the traditional the full lab based sap analysis is definitely the best otherwise yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the question was really just best way to address, as an example, some of the nutrients in the red boxes, best way to address these um, through plant foliar or through soil, short and long term. And my kind of answer there is a bit of both, um, because you're going to be, if the beauty then of a plant analysis, say a sap analysis, if you measure those and that's low immediately in the current crop, address it immediately through the foliar. So in that point, you're going to do that straight away. If you repeat that over a few years and you consistently start to see that trend, that those nutrients are always low in the sap, yeah, sure, I would start to think about maybe your long-term strategy of maybe trying to build up those levels in the soil. Um, but I would stress that I would wait and observe that for a few seasons successive in the sap analysis first because, you know, each year is different. Sometimes the weather conditions, as you know, um, sometimes certain nutrients for various reasons are just kind of more or less available in different years so it might if you were doing basing that off your first year of testing this it might just be that particular year or for a certain reason but if you see that a good kind of once you're hitting kind of the third year in you're seeing this pattern sure let's kind of maybe take a longer term view on maybe trying to address it um, through the soil but I would say that something like some of those trace elements because they're not so efficient in the soil application and we are talking quite low amounts to apply through the foliar Sometimes it's just easier to dress through the liquid anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, not too late if, if you're the Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I've seen in the example of nitrates, I've seen really quick turnarounds with an application of Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. So you've got a bit of that sulfur there, um, magnesium to maybe use some nitrogen for chlorophyll production. Um, and with some moly, so moly, mag sulfate, and a bit of carbon. I've seen this really drop nitrates very quick, very quickly within a couple of days. Yeah, for sure. So it helps immediately, especially through the foliar. Yeah. Okay, let's do the last one, and we'll go for carbon. No, you do have some labs. Yeah, I mean, Danny, do you want to chime in here? There's the guy over in um, Washington State, and then. But I, 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 I'm, yeah. Apical. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's grab some coffee and um, then we'll come back for the last session. <laughs>